think some of the points that I'll bring up about photography are maybe similar for, for filmmaking, but I um, hope that it's helpful for people of all different backgrounds. I like to start a lot of my talks about science communication with, with Jane Lubchenco because I've always really looked up to her and I started giving talks in colleges and high schools and none of the students ever knew who she was, um, which was kind of a bummer. <laughs> but I wanna briefly think about the relationship between science and communication. And although most of the time they're seen as separate, their communication is actually an essential part of science. And in her 1997 presidential address to AAAS um, that was later published as a paper in science, she outlined a new social contract for science. And one of the three main assumptions is that scientists will communicate their knowledge and understanding widely. So this is something that's kind of helped me realize the value in communicating science through imagery and just seeing it as maybe a different part of science rather than um, having quit science. So one way we can communicate science is uh, other than videos is photos and they can help uh, convey really complex scientific research that may never otherwise leave the pages of a scientific journal. This is a dye trace study at Silver Springs in Florida and the abstract of this paper is so complicated and even when you talk to the scientists like it's really hard to get a grasp on exactly what they were studying but this can kind of help make science um, beautiful and bring in viewers that wouldn't otherwise have seen this study. There is an interesting quote from a 1960 edition of Time magazine uh, where they say, indeed, it is the very absence of motion that gives the great photograph its unique qualities. It arrests the eye, invites reflection, provokes emotion. In this emotion piece, you'll, as we'll see, is really important um, with imagery when you're telling stories, even about science. I wanted to give a brief example of how images can be used in scientific papers and how I've used them. So this is a paper I published a couple of years ago about uh, turtles grazing in a Florida spring. And it has sort of this typical science paper name and aggregation of turtles in Florida springs yields insights into effects of grazing on vegetation, which is of course a mouthful. But what actually happened was that more than 500 turtles came into a spring um, and we were able to get a picture in here, which was cool. Um, but what the data looks like um, is this, and what this is showing is in you know science terms that there was a statistically significant decrease in the amount of vegetation in the spring. But no one's gonna wanna read this graph. It's not a good way to communicate with people. So these were the photos that we were able to include in there. And so these are gonna be much more, of course, um, you know, digestible and be able to communi communicate the same message much more effectively to a wider audience. So this is in the same spring where those photos were that I just showed. And one thing that photography is really good for is showing change over time that maybe we wouldn't um, otherwise notice. And so this is in Gilchrist Blue Spring uh, in January, 2017. And this is the exact same place one year later. So showing pretty photos like this are important. So if we just showed this image, it can maybe inspire people to explore, visit or protect nature, um, or you know, help people understand that these places exist in the first place. But if we're gonna show this, we do, I think it's our responsibility to also show this. But the problem is that by showing those two photos, it's not, people aren't gonna exactly know what's going on. They're gonna, it's good because it will get people to ask question, but, questions, but um, as Howard Chapnick writes in Truth Needs No Ally, which is a pretty famous book on photojournalism, great photographic essays are dependent on words to amplify the photograph, to interpret photographic ambiguities, to form a journalistic whole where words and pictures are perfectly matched. So this just gets at, of course, the importance of pairing the words and the photos. So we can talk, um, we know that um, scientists and scientific knowledge alone cannot create the resources and infrastructure needed to instigate societal change. Um, we've known this for a while in the communications literature, but why not, then what can? And I apologize if this is um, repetitive for some of you, but a lot of the way that we communicate is through the deficit model, which assumes that people just need more facts and information. And if they only knew what scientists knew, then 
they would be armed with the information to make better decisions. And we know that this does not work. So this is contrasted with the public engagement model, which says that knowledge is only one of the many factors that influences people's decisions. And this is where photography can kind of come in and be helpful because it can help get at these other pieces, which are values, beliefs, trust, etc. And so even if people have all of the same information as scientists have, and um, you know, you, you megaphone more information to them about science, it doesn't mean they're going to um, make the decision that maybe you want them to make. So another thing we can do when we're telling visual stories is use communication research to inform the images. And this image I'm going to give you use as an example, um, because there was a guy who identifies as a conservation psychologist who I discovered when I was working on my dissertation. And in 2009, he published a review of the literature about using images to influence conservation. And he published it, um, did it for the International League of Conservation Photographers. And that's a, you know, a group of photographers that uses images to try to inspire conservation and communicate science. And one of the main takeaways of his report was that the meaning of an image depends on what the viewer brings to it. So the reason why I show this photo is because people tend to really love this photo and get really excited about it. They see a manatee, they see clear water, people like clear water, um, you know, like the over under part. Uh, but when I see this photo as an ecologist, it's just absolutely devastating. Um, there are boat scars on the manatee. That's what those white stripes are. Um, and I see a creature that relies on upwards of 100 pounds of plants per day. Um, and I see it in a desolate landscape with no plants in sight. So this is actually kind of a, a sad photo communicating the, the drastic changes in our freshwater springs in Florida. But this is again where photos um, are stronger when paired with the caption or a story for context. So I want to show you an example of a story and I'll tell you a little bit about how I photographed it. And um, I think one of the big characters uh, takeaways from it as well is about characters but um, that we talked about with the videos but this is a natural sponge growing off the coast of East Africa. I just got back from Zanzibar a few weeks ago and I've been thinking a lot about sponges. Um, unlike they're aquatic invertebrates like corals but unlike corals they can live in freshwaters and estuaries as well. Uh, some species date back to about 600 million years and they can live from tide pools to over eight kilometers deep. Uh, unfortunately, this is not like a particularly compelling photo. And um, what I just told you about sponges is a list of facts and not a story. So even if stories focus on communicating science, there's still stories about other people like Samira mentioned. And a this is because a crucial part of storytelling is connection and people are gonna connect with other humans. And stories that allow us to go behind the scenes, um, which we'll call, I guess, um, about certain characters or character-driven narratives um, can help build trust in science and scientists as well, because we can see them as real people rather than um, just, you know, a, some distant other person. So even though this is a story about sponges, it's a story about the incredible women who form the sponges. We want the readers and viewers to connect with these women and see how extraordinary it is what they're doing. So for example, they're walking out to their sponge farms here and before learning to grow sponges, they actually did not know how to swim and they had to go through a year long mentorship program. And so you can see the water does get deeper and so they learn to swim and farm sponges during that year. So another one of the pieces that Myers um, found in his review of the literature was the importance of characters. And if we identify with a character, um, it will make it easier to identify with the story and communicate the science. And these people can help humanize different perspectives. And this was the main character in my story. Her name is Nasiri. And she used to be a seaweed farmer for about 10 years and now has been farming sponges for five years. And she was one of the first two sponge farmers on the island um, of Zanzibar and Jambiani. And she's helped train all of the rest of the women. So you can't tell some of those things from looking at this picture. So again, uh, it would be a good way to include that information in the caption. 
this is what the farms look like underwater. You can see all this fungus growing here. And so just having a variety of images is important. Having both underwater and above water gives people really a perspective on what's going on and um, you know what it looks like in this place that many, many people will never go. And I wanted to just mention very briefly some of the behind the scenes things. Um, and the first one is that most of my work, even though I work underwater, is of course above water and reading and researching and reading scientific papers and reaching out to people. But it's also time getting to know people once you get there and build trust and have people let you into their lives. So um, this is Shamisa and her home in Jambiani. And so we had to build enough trust with her first so that she would let us into her home. And you can see she's pretty comfortable here. Um, and so it takes time to do this. You don't just get to go and jump right in the water. And the other important part is giving people a voice. So you may go in with some preconceived notions of what you think the story is, but really listening and hearing them. And I learned so much more about sponges and sponge farming and everything. Um, you know, you can read all the scientific papers in the world, but once you get there, um, it might be very different on the ground. So remembering that it's their story, not yours. And uh, sharing is also important. This is me showing pictures to Nasiri at the end. And um, when you, we don't speak the same language, um, but sharing photos helps and build trust. And so they understand what you're doing with the camera. So there's a lot more than just publishing the images and communicating a science. It's also giving back to the people that have so generously let you into their lives um, and not making it just about you telling the story and leaving so how can you have an impact um, maybe you can help with local laws conservation protection of species and making sure there's an actual impact from your work so it's not just self-serving so the last thing that i'll say um, is just i guess we'll read reiterate is that there's a lot of research and the interdisciplinary partnerships are important so we could make immersive pieces that include 360 video or regular videos uh, with writing and images. And this is from that same special edition of on um, communication by Graf, another article by Grofman. And he just said that we need to make it interdisciplinary. So I guess the point of this presentation is that you don't need to become a photographer to communicate science, but these are some of the insights that I've um, found doing this for the past several years. And this was gonna be the transition to the filmmakers when I was gonna go first. Um, just to say that, you know, the visuals that we look at now are not in a vacuum, um, but that each medium reinforces each other. So we need a diversity of us working on this to make it the most effective. And that's it.